Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, the, uh, it's funny, I walked into this space, and uh, uh, I'm going to be turning 50 in the not-too-distant future, and my wife is uh, looking for a good spot to have a 50th birthday party, so uh, I may be back here. The, uh, so let's talk about go-to-market fit. You know, having been a three-time entrepreneur, one that failed, and two that were successful, and then talking to other entrepreneurs about how did they unlock growth after product market fit, we stumbled upon a pattern that was common across all these different companies we talked about in my own personal experience. And it gives a name to something that I think of as really almost like a bug in Silicon Valley, is that fundamentally, Silicon Valley and our entrepreneurial ecosystem is a really good product shop. We're really good at helping entrepreneurs build products. But I think what we do less well at is helping entrepreneurs build go-to-markets on the back of their products. So much so it's actually sort of biased in the naming and how we talk about it that there's product market fit. Can you sell your product to 10 or 20 customers? And then just sort of go figure out that sales and go-to-market thing. Like there's not even a name or a construct to have an intelligent, organized conversation around what needs to happen to unlock growth. And we feel like this is something that could become part of the dialogue, part of the nomenclature, and part of the way that companies think about what's next. So go-to-market fit is this core missing link, because when you achieve product market fit, that is a huge milestone. Uh, let me just do a quick straw poll in here. How many of you have zero revenue so far on your companies? OK. How many of you have less than a million? Uh, and more than a million. OK, so this is a great mix of folks at sort of different stages. And if you think back to your journey, finding product market fit, building a product that somebody cared about and was willing to give you money, that's a huge milestone. You should be really proud of that. But what then happens often is that, all right, great, we got product market fit, time to go. Let's hire a bunch of sales and marketing people, let's go sell. And we got this plan that goes up and to the right with a nice pretty green arrow. Everybody's excited. You wake up six months later, and you're just bumping along. You went from 20 customers to 22 to 23 to 25. And everybody's sort of looking at you going, what the hell? There's a missing link. And that's where this concept of go-to-market comes in. Go-to-market fit is solving this problem for how do you unlock growth with predictable, repeatable, scalable sales. And just to give you a sense for sort of go-to-market fit in action, I thought it'd be useful to pull some data from my last journey building a company at Mobile Iron. Mobile Iron was a mobile security company that we started in 2008. We spent the first year figuring out the product. We started selling at the end of 2009. And I think we had like 10, 12, 15 customers, something like that. In early 2010, we started to try and get our go-to-market fit playbook together and start to find this repeatable go-to-market motion. And we went from winning like 10 customers to 20 new customers to 25 new customers. But then we figured out our go-to-market fit recipe in Q3 2010. And that's what happened. We went from winning 10 to 20 customers to 50 to 100 to 200 to 250 to when we were really cranking, we were adding 500 new customers a quarter. Get this right, and it's magic. So rewind all the way back to the beginning, sort of turn on the time machine. How does it start? For those of you that are at various phases of your journey to find go-to-market fit, where do you start, and how do you do this? So interestingly, our search for go-to-market fit inadvertently began on a whiteboard. Uh, it was a guy named Mike Lee, actually, Mike Lee's whiteboard. Um, and Mike was our very first sales rep, sort of like Davy Crockett, finding the path in the woods, trying to get customers to talk to us, trying to win early deals. And on the right-hand side, he wrote, or on the left-hand side, wrote, here's stuff that got customers to keep talking to us. And on the right, it was, Here's what I thought customers would want to talk to us about that they didn't. And he did it for himself. And the really interesting thing is then other people in our little startup started to pay attention to the whiteboard. That's interesting. The customer wanted to talk about that. We didn't know about that. 
Or like we'd feel really offended that something we thought was really important actually wasn't that important. That, interesting, was the very beginning of our search to find go-to-market fit. We didn't know it at the time. So when does a company start to look for go-to-market fit? The answer is at the tail end of product market fit. Because what's happening, you're winning some deals, you're losing some deals, some deals go fast, some deals go slow. You've got some at-bats happening. This is the chance to pay really close attention and learn. Because this is where the universe is actually teaching all of us a lesson. We tend to focus on just the deals we won, which is logical, but it's just as important to pay attention to the deals we lost and why. Or deals that went really fast or deals that stalled. These patterns are incredibly important to sort of seeing the forest for the trees. Because, you know, I've been in your shoes, early stage startups are tough, you're just trying to survive. In many ways, you're like a lumberjack out in the forest just trying to chop down trees. And you're so focused on chopping down the trees, you kind of miss the forest. It's easy to do. So how do you kind of take a step back and try and find these patterns? And as a leadership team, you can pull your team together and say, all right, let's look at our deals. What did we win? Why did we lose? Our recommendation is have that conversation. Get systematic with your team about taking 20 deals, 30 deals, 10 deals. doesn't really matter, just enough to give you a real sample. And look at sort of happy customers that you won and churn customers or ones you lost. Like, who is the buyer? Why do they buy? But just as importantly, like, why now? Why did they say, I'm going to buy now and not wait a year? For deals you lost, why did they stall? Why did they lose? And also pay attention to how you found them and what was sort of the sales engagement you used to win them. Because these are the patterns that start to inform what becomes your go-to-market playbook. Who is your ideal customer profile? Why? What was the urgency? How did that customer decide? And how did we find them? A simple little framework like this allows you to pull your team together and gather all this market intelligence, customer intelligence, product intelligence that's strewn about your team and sort of pull it all together and you start to see the patterns. There's a company that I work with where we help them go through this exercise. And they sold analytics to a certain type of marketing organization. But when we found what deals got really big, the interesting thing is that it was because the demand generation team was in the meeting. They hadn't noticed that pattern because they were so busy selling to another part of the marketing organization, which was sort of their initial thesis, that they kind of missed the pattern where a couple of the deals got really big because there was somebody else there. So they were thinking about their go-to-market playbook incorrectly. They changed their inside sales call scripts. They changed some of their target marketing. They even changed some of their product based upon sort of finding that pattern. So once you start to see the patterns, it's good news because you're actually on the path to go-to-market fit now. And it's stressful, it's confusing, there's a lot of signals going on. You're, sometimes you're trying to figure out what's a pattern, what's a signal, and what's noise, but just stay at it. Because as you get more and more and more at bats, things will start to emerge. So now that you're actually saying, all right, time to find go-to-market fit, what is go-to-market fit? What are the three parts? So the first part is, are you lined up on an urgent wave that answers the question, why now and not six months from now? If the answer is maybe a year from now, you haven't found that urgent wave. The second thing is your go-to-market model. How are you going to sell? There are certain go-to-market models that are in vogue or style, like, hey, we're going to do freemium. Or, hey, you know, there's lots of sales models. You can do direct, indirect, channel, web, freemium, land, expand, upsell, marketing-led, sales-led, no touch. There's all sorts of versions of this. There's no right or wrong answer here. The only thing is there's the right answer for you. So you got to pick your sales model. And the third part of this is your go-to-market playbook. 
which is how do you repeatably find and win customers? So let's drill into this first part about finding urgency. So one of the terrific things about founders is your passion and hyper-focus on achieving your mission. The trick here is that's both a strength and it can be a weakness, which is that, and I was working with a startup in San Jose where the VP of engineering, one of the founders came in and said, we are just gonna ruthlessly focus on our bullseye and be 100% behind that and put all our wood behind that arrow. And we've won five customers, that must mean we found it. So the question I asked was, what if you're wrong? You put 100% of your wood behind that arrow, you're dead. So there's an irony here, which is sort of the meme about being 100% ruthlessly focused is sort of true, but sort of not true. And so this is some of the challenges of being an early stage founder, finding go-to-market fit, is that instead, what you need to do is cast a slightly wider net. A little bit to the left, a little bit to the right in terms of a slightly different customer, a little bit up, a little bit down in terms of a slightly different pain point. And be open to and test these adjacencies. Because the hot spot that you eventually point at and focus on may not actually be your founding idea. And I'll tell you sort of the mobile iron story on this one. When we first went out to go sell to customers, we had this belief that we were going to solve the management and security problem to enable enterprises, adopt mobile as a first-class citizen, and we built this multi-OS security and policy engine that we were really proud of. Uh. <laughs> well, we won some customers that wanted to use it to save some costs. That was cool. We won a couple customers there. But then we started to see a bunch of customers that said, you know what, actually, I just need your help with iPhone. All that other stuff I don't really care about. I just need your help with iPhone. And we're like, but what about this other big thing? We're like, no, we just need the help with the iPhone. We started to win some deals over there. So we started to see as like darts on the board, you know, casting a slightly wider net. And we realized is that our initial founding idea was not the hotspot. The hotspot was a little bit to the right. And I'll tell you what that felt like, which ties to something Tay said, which is that it felt like heresy. It felt like we were being heretical. And it was actually kind of hard emotionally to say, well, maybe this sort of founding idea that we were super proud of may not actually be the hotspot we focus on. Be open to the adjacencies. Your hotspot may or may not be what you initially thought it was. So once you figure out your hotspot, the question is, how do you sell to them? And the important thing here is that early stage startups can only do one go-to-market model. You can experiment with a couple, but in order to unlock growth, you get one. <laughs> it's just too hard for an early stage startup trying to win customers to do multiple go-to-markets. Just can't do it. So the question is, what are the choices and how do you choose? So there's a spectrum. On the left, is sort of full-touch, heavy sales model where you're doing a lot of direct touch to customers. We call that sales-led. That was Mobile Iron, actually. Marketing did a little bit of lead generation, sales kicked in and took over most of the playbook. In the middle, you have sort of a medium touch or low touch where marketing does the front end of the go-to-market motion and then like inside sales takes over and closes the deal. That's more like Marketo. And then you have the far right, which is zero touch which is like Atlassian or Twilio, Twilio or SendGrid, where literally customers just buy themselves and they don't have any salespeople. I'll tell you on the right is in vogue right now. Like venture capitalists love that to the right because you don't have to spend any money on sales and marketing. So you're gonna get pressure to say, go do that. That may or may not be the right answer for you and your product. If it's the wrong answer, you're actually killing your company. So the important message here is pick the right model for you. Now, I have two sort of pieces of advice here in terms of how to think about where to land on this spectrum. The first one is there's a lot of good literature out there on sort of picking sales models. Uh, there's a great uh, blog post by Mark Leslie 
called Leslie's Compass. So if you just read that, it's a great sort of treatise on the different options. Uh, the second point of advice here is if you sort of distill all the way down to the bottom, like what's the nugget, what's the punchline of how this works, my theory on this is it actually comes down to one thing, which is how does the customer decide to buy? How does the customer decide to buy? If you've got a product where the buyer and decider are the same person, and you can reach them through digital marketing, and the product's a well-understood product, guess what? You can do product-led zero-touch sales. Buyer, decider, same person, reach through digital marketing, everybody understands what the product is, it's easy to get them to decide. Now contrast that to you're going to be selling a new type of infrastructure to speed up storage to Fortune 500 companies. Is the buyer and decider the same person reach them through digital marketing and they're going to buy on a credit card? Probably not. How many people do you think are involved in that decision? Probably 20. So interestingly, sales core job in many ways is actually coordinating the buying decision on the customer's part. So if there's a single person and they could buy and decide themselves, you're on the right. If you've got a committee, you're on the left. In the middle is interesting, which is if the buyer is one person but the decider sits right next to them, that's where you can do marketing-led, and then sales sort of helps close it. Like, that's why that worked for Marketo, because the buyer was the chief marketing officer who said, I want this, and went to the CEO and said, can I buy this? They said, yes, right, right next to each other. So figure out where you are on that spectrum. You can experiment, but at the end of the day, you got to pick one. But here's really the key to all of this which is figuring out the repeatable marketing and sales playbook to find and win customers. Um, I completely undervalued this in the beginning of Mobile Iron. And I'll sort of share a funny story. So uh, this is a picture of me in January 2010, without a beard, a lot less gray hair, and about 10 pounds lighter. And we were getting Mobile Iron off the ground and hired VP of sales, we're starting to sell. And my head of sales, a guy named John Donnelly, was like, all right, we really need to polish the playbook and nail our go-to-market playbook. And I was like, all right, John. And in my head, I'm thinking, well, isn't that just like a good sales, good PowerPoint pitch and some good sales tactics? I was so wrong, embarrassingly and painfully wrong. Because when you get your go-to-market play playbook right, the reality is it becomes like the operating system for your entire go-to-market motion. It's incredibly powerful. And it's not just a powerful tool to be the operating system of your go-to-market. It actually becomes a really powerful tool to align the entire company around knowing what to do. And only looking through the rear view mirror for me, like I even get kind of the chills thinking about it, like how we kind of stumbled into something that became super powerful for us. And What's really important about this go-to-market playbook, it is not a 30-page Word document with a bunch of pictures. When you have it right, it fits on one page, maybe two. Getting to that is hard work. There was a startup in Seattle I was working with where the VP of sales came in and said, I've got a go-to-market playbook, and he handed me a 65-page Word document that was a brain dump of everything he'd ever learned. Can you imagine being a new sales or marketing rep being like, here, go sell? Like, I don't know what to do. So the good news is he was adaptable. Walked him through the go-to-market fit playbook, and he's like, all right, I can do this. We got most of this figured out. I'm just going to have to pull it together. So he proudly came back to me the next day and said, hey, I've got the playbook like halfway done. I was like, all right, great. Any guess as to how long it took them to get the playbook all the way done, to get the second half done? Four months. Four months. The reason is because forcing the company and the leaders to get on the same page as to how the go-to-market motion works, what everybody does and says, how everybody lines up behind it, requires a tremendous amount of sacrifice and distillation. But trust me, when you get it right, it's magic. So let's go through an example of actually building a go-to-market playbook so this goes from being conceptual to being concrete. 
So the first step, and this, this one actually sounds simple, but it's hilarious how hard this can be, is that you got to lay out the customer journey. What are the steps in your sales model? Could be sales-led, could be marketing-led, could be product-led. So let's give you an example. Like sales-led, this was Mobile Iron. Basically, marketing generated leads, we qualified them, and then handed off to sales. And sales did a first meeting, we then did a second meeting. We pushed the customer to do an evaluation, we had an executive meeting, and then a decision win. Got it, pretty straightforward. Well, if you're doing a marketing-led model, essentially you do digital marketing, you push people to a webinar, and then you try and get them to do a free trial, and you drive usage based on that free trial. And then based on the analytics, inside sales calls them. They get a purchase commit, and then very importantly, how do you onboard them, get to production, do an upsell and renew? Or if it's a product-led, like a Twilio or a SendGrid, the digital marketing pushes everybody to the website, they do a free trial, they get the usage, they buy with a credit card, and they expand. Now, every company, one second, I'll, the, uh, every company needs to figure out what your customer journey looks like. But there's a really important part of this to get right that is a common mistake, which is the journey has to represent the actual physics of your customer journey, not the stages that Salesforce.com comes pre-programmed with for forecasting. How many of you use the seven stages that Salesforce comes with that are 20%, 40%, 50%, 70%, 80%, 100% forecast? That's not this. <laughs> um, you really have to kind of blur your eyes and abstract away because this has nothing to do with forecasting. And by the way, nobody ever uses the weighted average forecasting stuff in Salesforce anyway. So the important thing is to blur your eyes and really understand what the physics of the customer journey is. And just getting your leaders on board with what does that journey look like, what are the major steps of that customer journey, sounds simple, but you'll be surprised that you'll be about 75% the same and 25% different. And it's really important that you nail down that 25% that's different. Because otherwise, the company doesn't know what to do. Yeah, you had a question there. Um, so the question was, are the three models related to product complexity and deal size? The answer is yes, but I actually, in my, my thesis, and this is just a Bob Tinker thesis, is those are the symptom, and the real thing is how the customer makes the decision. Because you could have a small deal size with a complex product, but if for some reason you can sell it really easily, pick the sales model that matches how the customer makes the decision. They're correlated. If it's a big ticket, it tends to be a more complicated decision. If it's a small ticket, it tends to be an easier decision. So I find people look for the concrete aspects of your product in pricing to make a decision. But I think it's more important to get down to the psychology of how the customer actually makes the decision. Because sometimes you can get a missed signal in there. But that's a great question, actually. Great question. OK, so now imagine you've got this whiteboard in your conference room. And we're going to do one of these in a little bit, actually. Maybe we're in your conference room where you've got the stages of your sales journey laid out across the top that are not your Salesforce forecasting stages. Now, the next thing is, what do people do and say at each stage? What do people do and say at each stage? And what's the wow? And I'll talk a little bit more about what the wow is in a second. So again, this sounds relatively simple. But you'd be surprised. Grab your head of marketing, head of product, and whoever's leading sales and say, all right, go up to the whiteboard and write this, you'll get 50% the same, 50% different, because everybody's got a slightly different version of reality in their brain. The company I was talking about earlier, this is what took them four months to get this nailed down. So I'm actually going to unblur that and show you what the real things were that were on our Mobile Iron go-to-market playbook. So, Getting these right requires sacrifice and distillation because there's lots of things you could say. What are the three things you're going to say? There's lots of things that could happen in a first meeting. What are the three things that must happen? So at Mobile Iron, at the front end, we basically hooked customers and got their attention with three things. Hey, do you have mobile devices and apps? Yes. Good. Hey, um, are users struggling with bring your own device? 
A um, little backstory in Mobile Iron, we invented the bring your own device concept. Customers were struggling with that, so that was a hook to get their attention. And the third thing was, hey, are you worried about security of your data that's moving out to mobile? There are lots of other things we could have talked about, but those were sort of the three hooks that we got them in initially. The question is, then what did we do? We drove them to a first meeting. That first meeting was typically a WebEx. Sometimes it was an in-person meeting. It was typically a WebEx where we'd explore their needs, talk about what we did. This is where we had the first pitch PowerPoint deck. We'd talk about how innovative we are. And then we'd have an ask, which is we'd like to do a deep dive. So we actually had a second meeting. Very rarely could we go from first meeting to eval. We typically had to have a second meeting because it was a relatively new product category where customers needed education. Then we pushed customers to eval. We'd turn them up with a live instance. We'd give them a test plan to go do. Now, interestingly, this is a spot where we struggle because what we found is customers didn't know what to do during an eval. Customers literally would do like a right to left, or sorry, a left to right user interface tour. That's how they do an eval. Well, let me just click on things, left to right. Did that work or not work? So we realized is we actually had to give them an evaluation guide, which is test these 10 things, and if they're green boxes, you pass the eval. What was also really interesting about that is that getting to what those 10 things are that you want to test during the eval, and to make sure the product did a good job of that, and the product actually was easier to use to be able to do that, and we stuck a couple competitive traps in there to blow up our competition, like that part of the sales playbook became a really important, very dynamic part of our engagement with customers. Then after the eval, we'd say, we'd like to present the results to your executive. So we'd like to make sure we have an executive meeting, then we get the decision and have the win. So this was sort of what people did and say at each stage. Well, this can sort of make people get bored because there's lots of things you could say, there's lots of things you could do. How do you sort of figure out what the things are to really pay attention to? The advice here is find the wow. And you're probably going in your head like, what's the wow, Bob? Uh, that sounds silly. So you know when you're in a meeting with a customer and you're walking through your pitch deck and you're talking about something, and all of a sudden you see their body language change? Like they sort of stop, sit up, lean in, and they're like, tell me more about that. That's a clue that you found a wow. Now. One of the big challenges with finding the wow is that the product team thinks what they know the wow is, because it's obviously the thing they work the hardest on and are most proud of. The trick is the product team doesn't get to decide what the wows are. The customers do, and the sales team does. And I'll tell you a story about this from Mobile Iron, which is that the um, we were really proud of our multi-OS policy and security engine for any mobile operating system that could help an enterprise make mobile a first-class citizen. <laughs> but during the demo and the PowerPoint pitch, we would show a customer how we could wipe your work stuff off your phone, but leave your pictures and music alone. Remember, this was like 2009, so that was pretty novel. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, thank you. <laughs> it was, it was a big deal. The, um, and you could see the customer go, wow. And when we took that back to our team, we're like, customers are really excited about that part. The reaction was, well, that was actually relatively easy to do. And they're like, really, that's the wow? Really? That, what, what about our multi-OS policy and security engine help it? You know, any mobile operating system be operated for mobile first citizen? No, it's that thing. And so it was a really good example of sort of realizing the customer gets to decide the wow. So the second interesting thing about the wow is I'm going to make up a number. I would bet 50% of the time you bury the wow in your product somewhere. Like you had to click three menu items down to go find the wow, 
in our initial UI. Like we literally, it was in a super logical place. It really was. It was in a very logical place. But we literally buried the golden egg. So we had to go back and change our product UI to like pull it all the way to the top and put a red box around it. Like, which kind of offended like our UI designer because it wasn't super logical for it to be there. But we're doing that because it was actually a wow during the front end of the go-to-market playbook. So we then found wow number two, which is, um, remember this is 2009, 2010. Mobile Iron pioneered the first enterprise app store. Remember when Apple first had their app store, that was kind of a big deal. We built the first enterprise one. And even if customers weren't yet ready to deploy their own enterprise apps, if we showed them that they could have their own enterprise app store someday, they were like, wow, show me more. Now, the interesting thing is customers weren't yet ready to deploy it. They didn't really need it yet. So our engineering team was like, well, who's deploying it? Who's using it? Not very many people, but it was a huge part of our sales playbook. So never confuse selling with installing. And your customers get to decide the wow, you don't. And the important thing is that your wows will evolve. As your product evolves, as the customer market evolves, Keep paying attention to those moments where the customer's body language changes. And they stand up and they lean in. They're like, tell me more. Those are the wows. Those are precious. Pay close attention. So at the end of each one of the stages, it's really, really important to have a crisp ask or a crisp action about how do you get to the next stage. So at the end of the first meeting, our Chris asked was, we'd like to have a second meeting deep dive. At the end of the second meeting, it was like, we'd like to do an eval. And in return for doing the eval, we'd like to make sure you bring your boss to the table for us to present the results. In that executive decision meeting, the ask was for the order. So one of the mistakes you sometimes see in go-to-market fit playbooks is the boundaries between them are kind of mushy, and they, customers just sort of wander through have a crisp ask and a crisp exit for every stage on your go-to-market playbook. It provides clarity, but more importantly, it actually gives guidance to your sales and marketing team for what to end on. OK, this is an important little aside here. But one of the things in the early days of Mobile Iron um, is that we built Mobile Iron before sort of big recurring businesses. So as we started to sell more recurring businesses, uh, more recurring customers, we realized we had a problem with our playbook. Because our playbook ended with win. The deal's done. In recurring businesses, it doesn't work that way. So one of the really important things to add to your go-to-market playbook is what happens after the win, which isn't really a win. It's really a commitment to you for like 12 months. You got to make sure you onboard them. You bring up to live production. You get them to upsell and renew. And so it is OK to actually have a two-page playbook, where one is sort of like selling and getting customers to commit, and the second one is almost like a customer success playbook, which is how to get them onboarded, how to get them activated, how do you do the upsell, how do you do the renew. That is just an important part of a playbook in a recurring business. OK, so we've done part one, which is lay out the, the physics of the sales journey, the customer journey across the top. We then worked on the, what do people say and do at each stage, and we find the wow. Now, this third part I'm going to talk about was something I only discovered by accident. And we did it basically sort of almost out of like project management, which is when you have the playbook, you have some deliverables that are there to sort of support each stage. And somebody's got to go build them, and you've got to track them and make sure you're delivering them. So this became a really important part of the playbook, which is what does the rest of the company do at each stage to support that stage of the playbook. And so what I only realized in the rearview mirror was this, this was an incredibly powerful force to unify the company behind the playbook. Because now this cacophony of crap that everybody's being asked to do all the time, people are wondering how it connects. All of a sudden, they now understand how what they're working on connects to the go-to-market playbook. That is amazingly powerful. So whether it's in the marketing and lead gen, you're developing SEO and SEM campaigns, or putting together a call script for an ISR inside sales rep, 
whether it's in the first meeting about doing a good PowerPoint presentation, or maybe instead doing a quick two and a half minute animated video that replaces the presentation. Or it's going back to your engineering team and saying we have to change the UI to elevate a wow we found that we didn't know about. Or it's doing an evaluation checklist in the eval stage that helps the customer understand what to test, and we know the product works for that. Or it's competitive analysis to be able to answer the questions during the executive meeting. All these different things that sort of you hear about and are part of go to market and just sort of feels like this endless to-do list of stuff, all of a sudden harmonizes and comes together. Because now the team knows how what they're doing fits to the go to market playbook. And only in the rearview mirror did I understand just how powerful and emotional tool that was. All right, now the fourth thing I'll talk about in terms of the go-to-market playbook is there's a free Benny that comes at the end in addition to unlocking growth. The free Benny at the end is that if you build this the right way, your metrics come for free because you just watch customers and prospects move from stage to stage to stage in the customer journey. You learn why they got stuck, why they kept moving, and the metrics come for free, and they actually match your playbook. So the final result is a one-page, maybe two-page playbook. When you get it right, what happens is you'll see a sales rep pin it up on their cube wall right in front of them. You'll have it on your wall. Your marketing person will have it on their wall. It becomes sort of the lingua franca for how you talk about the business, how you talk about the go-to-market. You get this right, it's magic. So when you have go-to-market fit, it's all three of these things working together. It's you're on an urgent wave that answers the question, why now and not six months from now? You've picked your sales model. You get one somewhere on the spectrum. And the third thing is you built your go-to-market playbook to repeatably find and win customers. And some lessons learned having been through this twice and working with other companies going through this and talking to other entrepreneurs going through the same journey, that there's some tough lessons in terms of building a go-to-market fit playbook, which is your initial biases are powerful. Don't let sort of these feelings of heresy get in your way. The patterns are hard to see because you're so busy trying to chop down trees, sometimes you miss the forest. And I believe psychologically, one of the reasons why this is so hard is because it takes all these things that are implicit, that are happening inside your team, and makes them explicit. That's the power too, but it's also the challenge. You have to get things from the subconscious to the conscious. To get it right requires a lot of distillation and sacrifice, and saying no to some things that some people may be very passionate about are an important part of the story. And I'll leave you with an interesting challenge that you only will find later. And Claire is going to talk about this in her session. I had to live about this. Once you get good to market fit and you're kind of cranking, part of what's so amazing about this, it becomes muscle memory. It's just terrific. Guess what happens when you need to change it later? It's really hard. Because the power of it, it's become automatic. Rewiring muscle memory of a 50-person sales team and a 20-person marketing organization, an entire company that's sort of geared around the way a go-to-market fit playbook works, it's hard. At Mobile Iron, we had to rewire go-to-market fit once and then the second time. The first time, it actually failed. We didn't do a good job. We just sort of created some new PowerPoint presentations, rolled out some training. Everybody sort of tried it and then drifted back. And I was like, ah, what do we do? So, Taking sort of lessons from like physical training where you have to sort of relearn muscle memory, sometimes it takes a little bit of shock value. I made every single sales rep and every single sales engineer and every single marketing person, 70, 80 people, present one-on-one -on -one to me the new story as if I was a customer. It was an incredibly inefficient use of my time in the micro, but at the macro, it was incredibly efficient, incredibly powerful. Sent a message that we're deadly serious about it. Everybody took it really seriously. It gave me a chance to see who got it and who didn't, and it worked. 90 days later, our muscle memory had changed. So if you're not able to find go-to-market fit, what does it feel like? Well, sales bumps along. 
And if you spend more money on sales and marketing, it doesn't really change much. And that's really scary. <laughs> um, closing deals requires founder selling. So one of the things about go-to-market fit is founders often can't figure out go-to-market fit. You need like a normal, mortal sales and marketing rep to actually help you find go-to-market fit. Because guess what, founders? You get this little magic founder pixie dust you can sprinkle into deals that changes things. You need to test it on somebody that doesn't have the little envelope of founder pixie dust in their pocket. Every deal feels different. That one, that one, that one, that one. They're kind of 50% the same, 50% different. And if you hire a new sales rep, they struggle to learn and be successful. These are all signals that you haven't found it yet. So the obvious flip of this is, OK, Bob, what does it feel like when you do have go-to-market fit? It feels like this. It feels like momentum. And it is one of the most fun things in building a startup, is when you start to feel that momentum. It's kind of why we do what we do. And it is a blast. All of a sudden, your leads and pipelines grow. Deals start to close, predict, close predictability. You invest more in sales and marketing. You get more out, which, by the way, investors care deeply about. New sales reps come on board. They know what to do. And the rest of the company knows what to do. You found go-to-market fit. So I want to share a couple go-to-market fit moments from other entrepreneurs that we talked to. So uh, Tinzo from Zwara. Uh, this went public, actually, a couple weeks ago. Um, interestingly, Teen and I were part of a little first-time CEO club back in 2008, where me, him, and two other guys got together, and we used to ask, ask, ask each other stupid questions. So you know, we've been on this journey together a long time. And Teen's go-to-market fit moment where they felt things change was at an executive offsite up at Cavalio Point, north of San Francisco and Marin. They sell subscription software, or subscription billing software, to companies. And in the early days, it was a very evangelical sale, trying to convince customers why they even needed subscription billing software. They had an executive offsite where the director of sales engineering put a bunch of logos up on the screen. And these were always sort of historically sort of the logos that we're talking to and evangelizing to. I think the guy's name was Matt. Uh, basically said, these customers are all going to be making decisions in the next six months. And it's either going to be us or somebody else. And you can see the team sort of go, what? Wait a minute. Like, we're no longer in sort of this evangelical sales mode. We've actually started to find a repeatable process where customers are actually now getting ready to make decisions. The game's changed. At Box, uh, I was talking to Aaron. Uh, we were sitting outside uh, by the Fox Theater in Redwood City about sort of this time in Box's life. And they were at about 5 million of ARR. And they were following sort of the bowling pin, bowling lane strategy, where you pick a vertical, find the lead pin, and sort of then go from there. But they were kind of struggling, because they had a big customers in financial services. They had big customers in professional services, healthcare, pharma. They hadn't sort of found the one lane that was really singing. But then when they pulled apart their customers and looked for the patterns about why they bought, who bought, What's the problem they were trying to solve? How'd they make the decision? They realized, holy crap, regardless of vertical, every customer is using us to solve the same problem. They had actually found a hidden horizontal playbook. They were just looking at it the wrong way. Growth took off. And for me, it was that point in the graph where I showed you earlier, where in the summer of 2010, we started to feel things crank. And, uh, my head of sales, John Donnelly, came into my office and basically said to this effect, said, um, hey, Bob, uh, I am willing to significantly take up my quota if you will let me hire a lot more people because I can't get to all the deals I see. Oh, awesome. Love to have that conversation. May all of you have your head of sales come in and have that conversation with you someday. That was the moment that it changed for us. And I will tell you that for every company, when they find this and start to feel the momentum, you'll, if you haven't found it yet, when you do, you will remember it. It will be like seared into your brain as one of those special moments in building a company. 
And when you find go-to-market fit, growth unlocks, everything changes. Everything changes for you and your team. This is the point where you shift from survival, which is how do I not die, to thrival, which is how do you win. It's a huge honor to get to this point. You should celebrate it, be proud. It's a blast. It's super fun. It's why we all do this. But get ready, because everything's changing. That finding go-to-market fit and thrival profoundly changes everything in the company and for the people, you and your teams. And all of a sudden, your mindset shifts from don't die to how do we win. You go from this mode of careful execution of pinching every penny to all of a sudden like calculated recklessness where you're doing stuff a little haphazardly to, to become a category leader. You feel a big culture change because you have this product-led culture that you're really proud about, and now you have to balance it with the go-to-market-led culture. And guess what? That's hard on the people that have been around for a while. All of a sudden, you're going from, we just got to win some deals to, how do we drive growth and prove our unit economics? People didn't really know about you. You didn't care that much. Now, all of a sudden, you're obsessing about awareness. Anything that talks about your category, you're like, it's got to be us on top. And you go from this mode where the founders and the CEO literally interview every candidate, and your team needs to be bleeding from the eyeballs before you give them another wreck, to all of a sudden, hire, go and you evaluate your leaders based on their ability to meet their hiring targets. Like, the left and the right are very different. Everything changes. And this has a profound impact on the people themselves, because as the company's changing, your roles and all your team's roles change, even though your title doesn't change. So as a result, the people need to change themselves, which is hard. Or, the unfortunate side effect of that is you have to change the people. And this happens all the time. And I think this gets to sort of the second bug in Silicon Valley, which is that I think we do a relatively poor job helping leadership teams understand how their jobs change and prepare them for it. So as a result, people sort of boil like a frog in a pot. They'll all of a sudden wake up and be like, you're not the person anymore. So why does this happen? And I think it's because that as everybody's roles change, they need to change themselves, that what's happening is the very things that help people be successful getting from A to B become the very things that hold you back or kill them going from B to C. This applies to the company, the go-to-market team, and the people. And it's a painful challenge. So I'll refer to one of the great leadership coaches of all time, Yoda, which, young Skywalker, you must unlearn what you've learned. You must unlearn what you've learned. And I love this concept of unlearn. Because we're always learning and we thrive on learning. But I think we need to bring to the fore sort of the same concept about what do I need to unlearn? Because that's stuff that really kind of gets in your way and sneaks up on you. So I want to talk about that. Because as you're finding go-to-market fit and building your go-to-market, this has a profound impact on your sales leadership. In the beginning... Sales is really like Davy Crockett. You're finding the path through the woods. You're trying some different things. You're trying this, you're trying that, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. What about this value proposition? What about this problem? You're trying to find the path through the woods. And that's exactly what you should be doing. But then as you start to find that path through the woods and the patterns start to emerge and your go-to-market fit playbook starts to come together, the job changes. It's no longer Davy Crockett. It's more like Joan of Arc or Braveheart, where you're leading a team of warriors against the enemy and go kill everybody. It's very much like a tribal warrior leader. It's a different type of person. And then, well, actually, let me stop for a second. So what changes? So you go from this pioneering mindset to more like a warrior leader, and the execution changes, because it's no longer about just sort of finding some deals and figuring it out to... Crap, i got to win some deals and repeat this playbook. And then the job changes again, where you shift from being sort of Joan of Arc or Braveheart to more like Eisenhower, who is a general of generals. You know Eisenhower never set foot on a battlefield? Ever. 
Yet he's largely credited with doing World War II. Why? He was an architect. He was a system thinker. He was the general of generals. He was in the war room. It's really hard for sales leaders to make this transition, to go from the battlefield to the war room. So I was talking to Mark Smith, who is the uh, SVP of sales at uh, NetScreen, then Infoblox, then Arista, then Rubrik. Like he's been through this journey several times. I was talking about sort of what's the hard part, what's the challenge about making the transition from the Joan of Arc Braveheart stage to the Eisenhower stage? Because not a lot of sales leaders make that transition. And he said, there's a couple things. But one of them is you have to go from being a battlefield warrior leader to being in the war room. That's a really different job. And he said he could sort of see in the eyes of his team that had been with him a little time longer for a while that they lost respect for him because he was becoming a politician, getting off the battlefield and heading into the war room. And that kind of sucked. And that kind of got in his way. But he realized that that's actually part of the job to make this transition is to go from the war field to the war room. The second big change is you have to shift from winning deals, hopping on a plane to go close this customer deal, which some of that happens, but it's no longer the story about this win and that win and this hard-fought battle and that hard-fought battle because you're focused on not winning the battle but winning the war and building a war machine. It's a really different job. Now, the reason why I bring this up is that finding go-to-market fit changes the sales leadership job. Accelerating the company changes the sales leadership job. Becoming a category leader changes the sales leadership job. So therefore, the sales leader must change themselves or be changed. Now, the thing is that this applies to the CEO too. If I look back on my experience at Mobile Iron, going from three people to nearly 1,000, I actually had three really different CEO jobs. The first one was like Captain America. It was like me and the platoon in the woods doing battle, like throwing punches, getting punched, banging into trees, digging ditches. It's great fun. But then the second CEO job, when we got to sort of 50, 60 people, was more like the Avengers, where all of a sudden I now had to hire a band of superheroes, each with a better superpower than I had, get everybody aligned going in the same direction to go beat the enemy and not kill each other. That was a different job. And then at about 500 people, the job changed again, which became more like Professor Xavier in the X-Men, where I was like the dean of a university. I had to do a lot less things for a lot more people, and I had to repeat myself a lot, which drove me crazy. And it got in my way, because I felt like that was non-value add, and I was like, gosh, people are just going to think I'm repeating myself. But guess what? That's actually part of your job. At that stage, you're a giant signal generator to keep everybody aligned on the mission. And if you have to repeat yourself, that's what you do. But I sort of felt like that was non-value add. And I was passing judgment on that part of the job based upon my past role. So I had to unlearn that. And this applies for every other leader. That going from survival role to growth road to scale role fundamentally changes everybody's jobs. As a result, you need to change yourself. And the key to that is unlearn. And I'll tell you, it's hard. It's really hard. And it kind of feels like this. <laughs> Which is, you're flying a plane. You're desperately trying to gain altitude, pulling back on the stick. You're under duress. You're under stress. And the last thing you want to do is rip open the fuselage and start screwing around the wiring. But yet, that's exactly what you have to do. Now, the good news is, even though it's painful and it's hard, it is a spectacular learning experience, personally, professionally, and a spectacular unlearning experience, personally and professionally, for both you and the rest of the team. So with that, may each of you find go-to-market fit, May each of you make that transition from survival to thrival, and may each of you experience the crazy change that comes along with that. So in order to actually uh, make this real and share a little bit more scar tissue about that journey, we're going to shift gears, 
Uh, but we're first going to take a quick break. So we're going to take a five-minute break. Actually, how long? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Francis? How long? Five? Five? Five-minute break. Grab some caffeine. Use the restroom if you need to. Uh, just get a refresh, get some fresh air. And we're going to come back, and we're going to start off with a panel about from three folks who are actually going through this right now. So uh, thank everyone for your attention, and uh, we'll see you back in five minutes.